Right, hello. Uh, I'm Tom Haynes. Um, I'm a platform engineer um, in the Common Platform team at ITV. Um, and yeah, so the Common Platform is sort of 10 years old this year. Uh, so we thought it was a good chance to um, sort of look back at what's changed and, and you know, equally what hasn't changed in the platform. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll say thank you to Linux Recruit uh, for the chance to speak today. Um, so I'm going to start by um, introducing what the Common Platform is, talk a bit about what we now call the base platform, um, before discussing uh, the different versions of the platform, which kind of mark the major points in its evolution over the sort of uh, 10 years. And then I'll move on to speak specifically about CP version 3, which is the most recent version of our platform, talk through its key features, um, in particular how we approached sort of rolling it out and upskilling the dev teams that use it. Uh, and lastly, talk through some kind of KPIs that we're using to uh, kind of track how it's doing. So what is ITV's common platform? Um, we provide ITV with a sort of development and hosting platform based on AWS. Um, we support um, five uh, or dev teams across five quite different business divisions that have different tech stacks, different ways of working. So the platform has always had to be quite flexible. Uh, and it's best described um, as a set of kind of patterns and standards founded on strong principles, um, in particular um, being highly aligned. So uh, no matter where you go within the company, the platform should look familiar, um, but loosely coupled, which means different parts of the platform can kind of move at their own speed. So to look um, a bit more closely at that, um, we partition our infrastructure into modular products. Each product serves one um, dev team. And we embed those into each division in a hub and spoke model. Um, yeah, and it's each product is an independent instance of the platform. Um, and what that means is um, you basically get what we now call the kind of CP base, which is a declarative description of your infrastructure's code um, via Terraform and Helm configuration, which we organize into semantically versioned shared modules. Those modules give you a kind of standard set of infrastructure, so um, observability workflow tooling, and then the kind of standard base infrastructure you'd expect which is your sort of uh, networking, DNS structures, that sort of thing. And that's all contained within a Git repo for that, for that product. Um, and then it, really importantly, um, there's a lot of modules. Uh, so all these different versions are aligned via what we call a composite platform release. So one thing that the core team does at the center of the hub and spoke, um, we will um, basically set a, take a cut of those module versions, test them together and stamp out one of these composite releases that are then applied by the embedded platform engineers that work alongside the, uh, the products in, in each division. Uh, so yeah, so this slide looks back, as I said, sort of 10 years, which is a long time in, in cloud computing, um, all the way back to 2014, which kind of comes back to when ITV um, first started looking at AWS. One of the very first kind of productionized workloads um, was uh, running ITV Player, which is the thing before ITV Hub, on uh, Samsung smart TVs. And that basically, that spike kind of grew into what the platform is. Um, and so you can see, yeah, over the years, there's been a few kind of big, big things launched. So ITV Hub in 2015, um, BritBox, ITVX, um, amazingly, like almost two years ago now. Um, and then sort of more technically, we could look at um, our first composite release, which we name after um, Elements, was Hydrogen back in 2018. We first deployed Lambdas back in 2017, um, introduced Kubernetes in 2019, which uh, corresponded with what we call version two of the platform that I'll release, uh, discuss a bit more in a bit. And then most recently, I guess, was CP version three, um, which was sort of the end of last year. And I joined in November 2016 and that was when Trump was elected the first time. Um, yeah, so to look at the versions, um, as I said, there's kind of been three major releases of the platform, and I'll step, I'll step through them now. Um, so in its sort of first conception, um, the platform was very much based on uh, configuration-managed EC2 instances that were provisioned by um, Terraform and Puppet. 
Terraform would essentially provision all the underlying infrastructure all the way up to the EC2 and then kind of pass the baton to Puppet, which would then configure the instance into whatever it was going to be. Um, and there was lots that was good about this. Um, we all, always treated our infrastructure as cattle, so we have kind of automated zero downtime uh, recycling jobs. It was very stable. Um, it was quite secure. We used the same sort of hardened AMI across the estate. Um, the issues were really that it was quite static, both in terms of the instances, um, so we couldn't auto-scale. Um, it was quite an expensive footprint. Um, and also the configuration was quite static, so um, particularly the puppet side of things was quite complex. It was quite hard to push change through. Um, so in about 2018, we um, had a big kind of workshop with our customers, so the dev teams, uh, talked about what they liked, what they didn't like, um, and very much it was about, um, they wanted us to enable kind of devs to be able to self-serve their own infrastructure and to reduce the complexity in the platform. Um, and also to in increase the commonality between products. Um, so the uh, basic idea of, of version two was to create a simple interface um, for a common use case, which was um, the stateless microservice that we knew a lot of devs were interested in. Um, and as I said, that kind of, uh, was when we first introduced Kubernetes to ITV. Um, and the whole platform, th this version was really centered around allowing devs to create Kubernetes microservices. Um, so the idea was uh, if the dev came to us with a Docker, their app packaged in a Docker image and a small piece of met metadata that told us how to um, deploy that image. Um, and they would both comply with our CP uh, v2 specification Essentially, we would then um, deploy and operate that service for them in a standardized way. Uh, and they would also get kind of standard deployment pipeline and, um, and sort of default set of observability. And so, yeah, I mean, that, pro that proved um, quite successful. We now have over 500 of these services deployed. And um, it's really sort of notable how they are exactly the same across the whole platform, which is super useful um, for the platform team. And obviously, we can lean on all the good stuff that Kubernetes gives you, such as the very fast deployments um, and things like dynamic auto-scaling. Um, uh, the issues were um, it was quite a narrow use case. So if a service or an application needed more, like a database or something, then that would still be um, the job of the platform engineer to, to provide it. Um, so I think around um, 2022, we once again, went back to the customers and discussed you know, what they liked, what they didn't like, and kind of a lot of the same themes came out. So they didn't want to wait on platform engineers. They wanted to be able to do more things, more self-service. They wanted support for, obviously, AWS are constantly adding more new services. So how can we support more and more things and, uh, and more, more standardization? So um, V3 was really about expanding and standardizing the interface to the platform. Um, which, yeah, I'll now talk in a bit more detail about version three, which is our new shiny thing. Um, so it can really be sort of broken down into kind of four key features. Um, so starting from, from the left, um, we provide uh, a sort of simple CLI tool for the devs to be able to um, spin up new instances very quickly. Um, those services will be described within a fully encapsulated um, set of configuration that's aligned around the service. Um, that config is deployed via um, a standard automated deployment pipeline that the devs can use to self-serve those deployments. And all of the um, infra config operates within this new um, kind of more opinionated Terraform framework where we enforce um, standardization and operability. Um, so yeah, so the move to service aligned infrastructure as code um, was, yeah, it was quite an important change for us. So it really involved lifting the faster moving service or application config up from the underlying CP base infrastructure, um, which served a few purposes. So it um, can act as a common ground for co-ownership uh, between the dev teams and the platform team. Um, and by having a sort of completely self-contained description of your service, it makes it quite easy for us to draw a blast radius around that. 
and to set permission quite strict permission boundaries around that service. Um, and having everything in one place is also sort of quite convenient. Um, so, so in terms of how the pipeline looks, um, so say a dev wants to make some change to their service, we enable them to kind of uh, develop and configure the Terraform code locally and test it against the real infrastructure. Um, and then when they're happy to make a change, they raise a pull request. That pull request is validated via our CI servers. And then um, once approved and merged, um, that service change is deployed again via GitHub Actions pipeline. Um, and that's operating. What's important is that's using a dedicated deployer role for that service, which is running within dedicated permissions boundary for that service. Um, the idea being that we restrict what that job can actually do just to the resources owned by that service. Um, which is, yeah, it's a really important part of the, uh, of the framework. Um, so we, as much as possible, try to use attribute-based access control, which essentially is a sort of tag-based access control. And that enables us to basically grant full access to a service um, to the things that it owns, but basically no access outside of that. Um, so, and this kind of leans on our sort of opinionated Terraform framework, so we can enforce a certain set of tags. Um, importantly, the service tag, which is used to kind of donate ownership. Um, and yeah, so that's really powerful. We basically give admin access to the services resources only. Uh, the only kind of caveat is um, there's incomplete support for ABAC um, across AWS services. And there is a roadmap and um, particularly uh, SQS is now supported since we went live. But there are still notable things like S3 and Dynamo that, that you know, kind of should be supported but aren't. Um, and in those cases, we fall back on uh, RBAC, sort of with naming conventions. Um, nice. So yeah, uh, sort of the last key feature I wanted to talk to was uh, the Terraform framework. Um, that's kind of centered around our component modules. Each component module provisions a single functional unit of infrastructure. Um, and they basically form the building blocks of our um, functionality. Each is created from a module template and uh, complies with uh, another CPV3 specification. And that's where we're able to do things like enforce the tagging. Um, and a, yeah, a really important aspect is we want these modules to be sort of batteries included. So they will include this boilerplate integrations with our observability tooling. And they'll include a good baseline of monitoring and, and logging and that sort of thing. Um, so, those component modules are discoverable via our service catalog, which, which serves as an index to our CP init bootstrapper tool. So it allows devs to discover the available implementations and spin them up quickly. Um, it also, so for use cases that need, um, that combine multiple component modules um, for composite functions, so something like, a, uh, like an event-driven SQS Lambda pipeline, we wrap that up in a, in a what we call a sort of a wrapper module, lightweight Terraform wrapper module. Um, and this also serves as a really convenient uh, test bed where we can all basically automatically test the integration points between components. And uh, we use uh, Renovate to automatically push updates through into this catalog. And the last thing I want to mention was the developer pathway. So um, we've tried to be as sort of easy as possible the further, so the further you are away from production, the more you can do. So initially, devs have full admin access to a sandbox environment. But importantly, that environment is structured to be as live-like as possible. And then when they promote their stuff into their real dev environments, we lock things down a bit. But they can still deploy from feature branches. And then when they actually get to production, everything has to be peer-reviewed and fully released. Um, cool. So yeah, I want to talk a bit about uh, how we approach the rollout, which is sort of not technical, but uh, still really interesting and really important. Because um, we were basically asking dev teams to change the way they were working. So we wanted them to actually take ownership of the infrastructure and sort of share responsibility for it, which is quite a big change and some devs are grumpy. Um, so we worked with a dedicated business change team. Um, which was great. I really enjoyed it. If we hadn't done this, we'd have just 
sort of made it up as we went along. Um, and they were great at kind of driving awareness and desire. So getting the devs to know what this was, why they might want it. And then we spent a lot of last year um, developing these kind of learning pathways to train the devs up. Um, and then as soon as possible, tried to identify good use cases where they could start to use these new tools uh, kind of in anger. And lastly, and the thing that's ongoing is the reinforcement. So um, each dev team, every six months, we're going through a kind of health check with them um, where they can fill out a form and kind of track how they're getting on with the platform if there's anything you know, we need to improve. Um, so obviously, yeah, there's, there's quite a few devs at ITV, obviously. Um, so we divided the dev teams up into um, four cohorts. And each, then each cohort was taken through this learning pathway where the um, sort of level was, was tailored to the kind of appetite and the requirements of the devs and the dev teams. And we tried to get most devs through the kind of foundation level so they had a good, good understanding of the kind of basics. But then if they wanted to, they could go all the way you know, to kind of super user where we would take them through how they would create their own Terraform modules um, for components we don't support. And that's something that's, that you know, devs have done that now, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so in terms of KPIs, so we took 122 devs to core level last year and about half that to, to the kind of advanced super user level. Um, and we did sort of poll them afterwards and they, they tended to say it was useful, which is good. Um, but kind of more interestingly, um, the platform KPIs. So there were kind of three uh, key objectives we had at the start of the project which was um, well, sort of mainly to enable self-service. And so we look at um, the rate of the percentage of service infrastructure change that's done by the non-platform engineer. Um, and previously it was sort of less than a fifth and now is um, a majority. And the per product um, frequency of production infrastructure deployment. Um, so that, that's, that's production infrastructure change, not application code change which happens all the time. Um, this is, yeah, so infrastructure used to be sort of every five days and now it's, it's more than once a day. Um, and the third thing was about sort of standardization um, and the amount of kind of our shared Terraform module usage um, with CPV3 is, is virtually everything. Um, cool, so uh, I think you can sum up CP, the history of CP is one of kind of evolution, not revolution. Um, the, the base structure of our products um, hasn't really changed that much throughout the platform's development. Um, and that's a testament to, you know, if you get good modular logical design right, it really can stand the test of time. Um, but kind of on top of that, each of these versions has increasingly tried to enable devs to self-service infrastructure, but to do it in a safe way. So. Um, we like the expression, the kind of paved road to make it easy to do the right thing. Um, and one of the key challenges that remains is we still need to cater for a range of, of developer appetites. And some devs still don't want to leave their IDEs. Um, uh, yeah, so in terms of what's next, um, we're trying to be community driven. So the, the devs, there's a public feature request board. The devs can um, you know, raise bugs or raise features. Um, but the kind of big things definitely looking at is Open telemetry it looks really interesting for all of our observability data. We started um, rolling out Terraform test. Um, that looks really cool, the newer versions of Terraform. Um, and yeah, very much pivoting towards GitHub Actions and away from Jenkins, um, which again helps to enable devs uh, to sort of self-serve their pipelines. Um, thank you.